Good morning. Uh, this morning reading is from Paul's epistle to the church in Galatia, chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. If you want to follow in the Red Bible, it's on page 1172. Chapter 13 of the Galatians 5. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and enjoying each other. That is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Colin. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name's Paul, if I haven't met you before, and it's lovely to have you join us as we continue to work through this series. I, I will excuse, I'm a little bit blocked up this morning. Apologies for that, but hopefully I'm still audible. This is a series called Frontline, which is all about how we live out our faith, wherever God's placed us, wherever that may be for each of us. We all have a frontline, a place where we engage with people who are not believers, and we can witness for God. In a moment, we'll watch our second video. So Maggie, if you could tee that up, that'd be great. But just a very quick recap of week one. Last week, I spoke about identifying our front lines, working out those places in our life where we spend a lot of our time with people outside the church. I talked about how Jesus is Lord of our front lines. God, God's already at work out there, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it, and he's drawing us in, using us where God's at work. And then the call that God puts on us in our front lines to serve him, to be present and engaged and ready to be used by God. So today we're sort of going to start the, the six core weeks of this series. Um, and each of these is a different thing we can try to do on our front lines. So we'll, we'll go to the video. All good to go, Maggie? Enjoy. Occasionally I go to coffee shops. There's something about the warm hubbub of a really good coffee shop that makes for great conversations. As for the coffee itself, well, the coffee's pretty good every time. But my experience of being served, well, that varies enormously. Some baristas make you feel like you're part of a production line, just another gullet to fill and another wallet to empty. Other baristas, well, they make you feel like they're really pleased to see you. Welcome. And they're always like that, even though sometimes they too must have had a really bad night's sleep or had to stand waiting for the bus in the rain for half an hour or be worried about their mum or maybe just have had a couple of really cranky customers complaining about the chocolate on their cappuccinos. No, they're really always pleased to see you. They don't just want to 
wish you a nice day. They want to make your day nicer. Character shines through in everything we do. Character does shine through in everything we do. Still, when we think about modelling godly character on our front lines, it isn't just about being nice, it's not just about hovering through life with some serene, beatific grin on our faces. Jesus wasn't always nice and things were rarely easy. Indeed, modelling godly character requires more than niceness, just as real love is more than niceness. Love requires courage determination, discernment. Modelling godly character is the fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives, in tough times and in easy times. It's him working in us as we allow him to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Now that's a pretty daunting list, isn't it? I wonder how would you mark yourself on a list like that at the end of an average day? Let me tell you a true story. Louise worked for an absolute ogre. She was PA to probably the most unreasonable boss in Buckinghamshire. He was bad-tempered, he was changeable, he was indifferent to other people. And she worked for him for three years. She prayed for strength. She prayed that he would change, but he didn't. And she often felt like a failure. In the end, she just couldn't take it any longer, and she left, feeling like she'd let God down. Three weeks later, the woman who replaced her called her up and said, he is impossible. I've been here three weeks, and I'm already thinking about leaving. How did you do it? I talked to other people and they said, you were fantastic, you were patient, you were gracious, you were always upbeat, despite his impossible ways. How did you do it? How did she do it? Well, of course, the first thing is that Louise didn't really think she'd done anything at all. Often, we don't do. We, we, we don't think we've done anything at all. But then, then someone tells us, you were so patient, you were so calm, you were so thoughtful, when everybody around you was completely losing the plot. The truth is, that when we became Christians, God changed us. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. You know, I take that at face value. I was a caterpillar. And when I was a caterpillar, there were only two ways to fly. On a leaf's back, or in a bird's beak. But now I'm a butterfly, and I thank the Lord for giving me wings. I can fly. We are new creatures with new capacities. And the Lord doesn't just give us new capacities, he gives us new fuel, his gracious Holy Spirit working in us. His gracious Holy Spirit wanting to work in us more and more, wanting not only to point us to Jesus, but to make us more like Jesus. Of course, we can't be complacent. We all have such a long way to go. But nor should we be ungrateful. God has made us new and has promised to be at work in us. So as we seek to model godly character, we don't do so in our own strength. We don't try to grit our teeth and summon up some smidgen of love, some atom of patience for that belligerent, bad-tempered bully of a centre-half in our football team. We go to God. Now another thing that Louise realised about her failure on the front line was that God had been working in and through her all that time and that others had seen it and been amazed by it. Just because we're struggling doesn't mean that God isn't working. I wonder, where does the rubber hit the road for you on your front line? Who are the people, what are the situations where you know you've needed God's Spirit to help you. 
What are the situations where you wish you'd called on him to help you? Where you wish you could have been just a wee bit different? Of course, Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians is not meant to be exhaustive. There are other lists. But for now, let me focus on two streams of thought. First, selfless love. Most of the fruit involve our attitude and behaviour towards other people, love for others, patience and gentleness with others, kindness, goodness, faithfulness to others. And yes, self-control, because when I'm not self-controlled, someone else usually gets hurt. The second strand of thought is a kind of inner assurance, joy and peace. Now, I don't think joy means that we have to be highly carbonated, constantly effervescent people. There are plenty of joyous Christian people who aren't extroverts, but there's just something about them, isn't there? Something luminous that radiates out, something that makes you just pleased to see them walk into a room. In Galatians, Paul summarizes it all as freedom. Christ's grace and love frees us from the power of sin and frees us from the hamster wheel of legalism. His love graces us with that deep assurance of God's love which gives us joy and peace and enables us to be other-centered. As the Apostle John puts it, we love because God first loved us. So godly character springs from our new identity in Christ. We are new creatures. Godly character ripens from the power of his spirit working in us, in his own quiet and determined way. Actually, I suspect that most of us will one day be joyously surprised, probably astonished, by the way God has chosen to work through us. May the Lord shine through you this week. Thank you, Maggie. That's Mark Green. He's our presenter for a few weeks, and uh, I think he's fantastic. As we go through this little block in the middle, uh, we're working through six, six things that start with the letter M. So the idea is they're memorable, that you can hopefully, you know, your mind can hook onto the letter M. And there's six ways this series explains that we can try and live out our faith um, on our front lines. Modeling godly character, making good work, ministering love and grace, molding culture, being a mouthpiece for truth and justice, and being a messenger of the gospel. Today, it's all about modeling godly character. And really, our focus today is this idea that God empowers us by his spirit to live with godly character on our front lines. That's what we're focusing on. Let's have a look at this. Firstly, one of the basic points from what we've seen so far is that God's spirit can grow godly character in us. God's Spirit can grow this in us. The fruit of the Spirit, it's a famous list from Galatians chapter 5. Nine markers of the Spirit's work in someone's life. As it was said, it's not an exhaustive list. There are other wonderful character traits that we can show. But it's a good list. It's a pretty good list. And so we're going to have a look at this text for a moment. This passage was written in the context of the Apostle Paul who was critiquing some believers who were still seeing the Old Testament law as maybe part of how they should be right with God. And the previous section in um, Galatians 5 is all about circumcision and Paul saying that is not required to be a follower of Jesus. Paul's been very clear in Galatians that being a follower of Jesus is about trusting in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, Jesus' death and resurrection for our sake, taking upon himself the punishment for our sin and rising to new life so we can be forgiven and free. Paul's very clear about this wonderful good news in Galatians and he really wants to make sure none of his readers are confused and think they need to still be following Old Testament law. So he starts by emphasizing freedom. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But Paul's, he's no dummy. He knows the natural response to a wonderful reminder of freedom is well, what's to stop me sinning then? If I'm free, if I'm genuinely free, surely I just do anything I want. If that's really the case, if I'm just forgiven, I just live the life that I could desire, I don't have to worry about God's call on me. Are you suggesting, Apostle Paul, anarchy or wild behavior or lawlessness? Paul addresses this in the very next sentence. Do not use your freedom 
to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another in love. He says, you're called to be free, so exercise your freedom in a particular way. Not in indulgence of personal sinful desires, but in serving one another. And then he outlines some outcomes of living a life dictated to by sinful desires. These things he calls acts of the flesh. Acts of the flesh immediately makes me think of very physical actions, actions that involve kind of flesh and blood. And some of them are, but Paul's list also includes a lot of mental attitudes, a lot of thoughts um, that are contrary to God's desire. I'll read that list. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. And then Paul immediately contrasts this with the fruit of the Spirit. This is the kind of thing that we are to exhibit, even in our freedom. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are what God calls us to display. The other big point that's important to grasp as we think about the fruit of the Spirit is that these are produced by the Spirit. I want to just consider this for a moment. I think Paul's very deliberate with his imagery here, as he always is. He's not saying these are things you must pursue or these are the fruit of your labors. That can often be a perspective we hear. He says they're, they're fruit of the Spirit. So the image is of a tree, of a fruit tree, maybe an apple tree or something. In the same way an apple tree produces apples, a spirit tree, if, if I'm extending the analogy here, a person in whom the Spirit's at work, someone in whom the Spirit dwells, produces these things. That's the fruit you should see. You won't visibly see the Spirit, but you'll see the fruit. The fruit are not so much goals as they are the outworking of God's Spirit in our lives. Alright, so the, na- the next natural question I think is, how do we see these grow, right? If, if we want to show these character traits God calls us to display, but if they're produced by the Spirit, what do we do? What is our responsibility? What is our role? How do we grow? Do we just pray just once we say God grow these in me by your spirit and then that's it we just sit back and and God will do everything there's a sense we might get that I'm not actually responsible for what's produced in my life I don't think that's quite it let me flag two phrases that come up in our passage these kind of bookend the passage one's at the start one's at the end early on we read this Paul writes so I say walk by the spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then right near the end, verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. I think that language is important. Walk by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. What do these images mean? What this shows is we are called to partner with God here. Yes, we absolutely do need to pray for God's Spirit to be at work in our lives. But we also need to walk with the Lord. That's going to mean things like spending time with God, praying to God, reading the Bible, gathering with His people, reflecting on our lives, coming to God in confession, and receiving assurance of forgiveness. We need to be attuned to the Spirit's prompting in our life, which more and more becomes the same or or joins with our own conscience. So when something happens, if you can even maybe think of a situation you might be in, there's a dispute, there's a tricky conversation, a difficult decision. We don't immediately fight or flight or freeze, I think are the the classic responses. Instead, we're we're thinking about God and we're aware of God's presence so much, we, we think of love. How can I love my neighbor here? We think of peace. How can I be peaceful here? It becomes more and more natural for us as we allow the Spirit to prompt us in what we do. Now, we'll all get it right sometimes, and we'll all get it wrong sometimes, and sometimes we'll look back and we'll think, okay, I just forgot about God at that moment. I can see that now. Or even you can think, actually, I think God wanted me to do one thing then, and I went and did the opposite. I was just so swept up in what was happening. What do we do then? Well, we confess our sin we thank God again for his forgiveness and we start a new day and that's walking by the spirit that's keeping in step with the spirit 
Now, I suspect for all of us, these nine fruit of the Spirit shine through our lives in different ways. <clears throat> and I reckon for most of us as well, some shine a bit more brightly and some are possibly less prominent. So, look, I wanted to keep things interactive and some of you will hate me for this. So, look, participate to the point that you're comfortable with. But I'd love to just display, perhaps, for a moment, some of the fruit of the Spirit that we see around us. So what we're going to do, I'm going to move my guitar so it doesn't get damaged. Uh, let me encourage you, have a think. There's the nine fruit of the Spirit there. Just think of one that you think you've noticed God working through you, one that's shining in your life, and one that you know needs growth. Just one of each. That's all I'm asking. And then come up, come up and grab a green dot for one that you think is shining in your life to some degree. And I, I think they're like a brown, a brown dot for one, not so much. And just put it on the board. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do this now. If you're not able to get up easily, you could always nudge the person next to you and go, you know, green for joy, brown for patience or something. Um, and they can come up and put a couple of dots up. So let me encourage you to do this. I know we don't do this very much. Let's just enjoy it. Maybe Robin, if you could play some music while we do this, well, that would be, lo that'd be lovely. And let's do this now. I'm going to kick it off, but please line up behind me.
Well, thank you. Thanks for participating in that. I, I find it always interesting and a, an interesting reflection on how we see ourselves. Wow, self-control, not, not seen as the strongest suit, a bit of a mix, peace, love, kindness, strongest, gentle. Yeah, it's very interesting. Maybe close to 50-50 for patients. Well, it's interesting to see and hopefully it gives you a sense of solidarity, if nothing else. <laughs> So this is the first thing. God's spirit can grow godly character in us. And none of us are perfect. It's always a work in progress, but we trust in God for it. The second thing is that we can live out our character on our front line. And I want to think about this in a couple of ways. Firstly, the, the general idea is we can model godly character. When on our front line, our godly character can have an incredible effect where we are. But I think particularly when the environment is tough, when the context is tough. Maybe if there's a context of, of bullying or rude jokes or perfectionism or judgmentalism, I think godly character shines so brightly in some of those places. We can make our front line more pleasant. Uh, our character can be a blessing to others when it's displayed. And there's a way in, well, in which it can also be a silent rebuke to those who are exhibiting problematic behavior and words. Or when everyone else is making sarcastic comments about something, we can actually shine brightly by being genuine and sincere. When others are worked up and frantic and there's just this sense of work pressure, we can actually shine brightly by being peaceful and being self-controlled. Where there's a lot of judgmentalism in a culture, in a social setting, we can shine brightly by showing grace and kindness. We can bless those in need of blessing and silence, or at least maybe contrast with those who are doing harm. And it's a great witness for Jesus, I think, when we shine brightly. It's not always going to be the case. Some people will roll their eyes at what we do and they'll think, oh, Paul, he just doesn't get the vibe. You know, he's just kind of, he's a bit too, you know, whatever it is. Or maybe more positively, you know, Paul, yeah, he's just nice. He's just a bit careful in what he says. Sometimes it w you won't feel like it's doing a great job for representing Jesus, but I think sometimes it is, and sometimes it shines very brightly. I love the video where Mark talked about Louise and how she got this call from her replacement three weeks later. And the, call, the question was, how did you do this job for so long? Now, we didn't get to hear what Louise said necessarily after that, but... What an amazing opening to witness to God's work in her life, to say something like, honestly, I just relied on God every day in that job because it was so hard. Or I prayed to God every morning, please give me the strength for this day. So I think feeling out of place can draw attention to ourselves, which can be used to point people to Jesus. So we can model a godly character. The other thing is we can actually grow our character on the front line. And I want to speak about this for a moment because I think the picture I have is that I, I know I need to walk with the Spirit in my own time. You know, th when I'm reading the Bible and praying, I'm, I'm connecting with God. When I gather with His people, it's like this is my recharge time. You know, I'm, I'm with His people. The context is, is, is believers around me. The context is people with God's Spirit. I sort of load up my spiritual batteries and then uh, I'm out there, you know, amongst everyone else and I'm just fighting the good fight trying to be patient and trying to muster some self-control it's not a terrible image I, I definitely get that and I, I feel this a lot but I, I want to remind myself that the front line itself is also a place of growth it's a place where God's spirit can actually do work in me it, it's not quite that binary I think especially when it's hard in Romans Paul writes this about particularly about suffering and hardship and how it leads to character growth, even where it's hard. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. It's actually in the hard places sometimes where we can grow the most, where in a bizarre sense, our spiritual batteries, if you like, are actually getting recharged. Our character is growing to be more like Jesus, even amidst the tricky context. In the video, I think you might remember, Louise found this to be true. She grew in patience in that uncomfortable place she worked. Day in and day out, God gave her that fruit of the Spirit in that hard place. You might think of your front line, a similar situation where you've seen that work happen. And looking back, you think, wow, I've become a lot more patient on day 100 
that I was on day one. Praise God for growing that in me. So we've considered God's spirit can grow godly character in us and we can live this out in our front line. But the final point I want to consider is uh, we can encourage each other in this. We can encourage each other in this. What I was really struck by in the video was Louise's reaction that she didn't think she was doing a particularly godly work, uh, job in her work. She left thinking I was a failure. She left thinking, I can't believe I only lasted three years and I had to leave. But her replacement calls and says, I'm dying at three weeks here. How on earth did you last three years? How did you stay that long? In the video, it was actually someone else who saw God's I want to say self-control, patience, certainly perseverance in Louise. I reckon this is common. I think we don't always naturally see this in ourselves. I think often Aussies, we, we can be pretty self-deprecating. It's not always a bad thing. But it's wonderful to be able to encourage someone else and point out a godly characteristic you see that's growing in their lives. Sometimes we need another person to do that to us. And I think this is something we can do as a church to encourage each other in our challenges on our front line because some front lines are really isolating if you're the only christian at your work if you're caring for family and none of them are believers if your social context means it's just you you're the only believer there i think it can be really hard and i want to encourage us to encourage each other small groups are a great place for this in our small group we do this every single week we go around we share what's happening in each other's lives we encourage people and we pray for each other pretty simple but it's so helpful uh we might say pray for me this week i've got something coming up i need patience this is going to be hard and we encourage someone in that always speak to me if you'd like to be involved in a small group there's plenty that you could join but i think we can do it as a whole church too it's a little bit trickier but um look because you did that first uh little interaction so well i want to do one other thing just before i finish we've put down some dots showing fruit of the spirit for ourselves and maybe areas we would like to grow but what I'd love you to do is to put down a, a star for someone else. Now, let me explain this. Think of someone in this congregation, ideally in this room, but not necessarily, but certainly part of our broader church family. Um, and I'd love you to come up in a moment and, and put a star down for the, that person on a character trait that you think they really shine in. And then I'd love you to tell them. Maybe that's the heart of it. Maybe before you talk about the footy scores or what's happening this week over your cup of tea, just say to someone, hey, I just want to let you know, I think you've got wonderful patience or you shine with joy. Just be encouraged in that. Keep it simple and encourage each other. I'm going to try this now. Can I call on you, Robin, to play a bit more music? If that's all right. Um, there are some stars here. There are some silver and gold stars. Now, I'm not getting you to put the names up, but I'd love you to remember who your star was for. So as you come up, take a star, um, grab a silver or gold star, put it, on the, put it on the characteristic and remember who it was, and then afterwards, encourage them. So come on up, I'm gonna go first, and uh, let's do this together. Thanks, thanks Robin.
Oh, thanks everyone. Well done. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, a lot of faithfulness sparkling through in our congregation and um, yeah, a lot of other ones too. Kindness too, joy. Well, thank you. Please, if you can, try and remember to encourage someone afterwards. Let me pray as we close this morning. Lord God, today we thank you so much for your spirit in our lives. For all here who trust in Jesus, Lord, we thank you for that assurance that you give us your spirit to do your work in us. And Lord, thank you that your spirit is at work in us, producing godly character through our lives. Lord, I pray that each of us will continue to walk by the spirit, staying close to you, Lord Jesus, day by day, being sensitive and attuned to the voice of the spirit in our lives and our conscience as it's guided by God. Help us, Lord, particularly in in our front lines, in those places where there's many people who don't believe in you, Help us to live this out, to shine these characteristics, to display the fruit of the Spirit, to hear your voice and be attuned to what you're saying to us. Lord, particularly when it's hard, I pray that you would use us to shine for you. And Lord, help us as well in those hard places to know that you continue to grow us, you continue to do your work, even when it's difficult. And Lord, I pray as well that as believers, we would encourage each other. Help us, Lord, to remind each other of the way we see you at work through each other's lives. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful gift of our church, of each other. And I pray that would be an encouragement for us as we seek to model godly character wherever you've placed us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, We're going to close with one final song this morning. Uh, This is a song reminding us and encouraging